India's financial services market has been growing steadily over the last few years. Rising income coupled with greater acceptance of investing in non-traditional assets has spurred a growth in demand for new age financial products and services. While the traditional mutual fund and life insurance segments have shown a healthy growth, what is interesting is that demand for alternative investments has gone up rapidly. The AIF industry or alternative investment funds industry consists of private equity funds, debt funds and hedge funds. AIF and PMS platforms today stand close to Rs 6 lakh crores in AUM and are expected to reach Rs 30 lakh crores in the next 10 years. This points to the fact that PMS and AIF products are emerging as strong alternatives to grow wealth and investments. Add to this the fact that the number of HNIs or high net worth individuals in India is expected to touch 6.11 lakh by 2025 and that India is leading the race in unicorn creation with 40 plus added to the tally in 2021 alone and you have a very interesting investment climate in the country where expert and honest advice will make sure you are ahead of the curve. While growth in a business is important, what's even more important is to find the right partner, an expert who can help take things to the next level. On this very special episode of ET Global Business Summit Disrupt X, we're taking a look at the story of one such expert in the financial services space, an expert that has a presence across multiple verticals, Avendis Group. The Avendis Group is a leading financial services company with a presence in 10 cities across 4 countries worldwide. They are a leading provider of financial services for the last 22 years and has been creating differentiated solutions in asset management, credit solutions, investment banking and wealth management for their customers. With a strong footprint in the consumer, digital and technology space and being a leading alternative investments platform, they help entrepreneurs, wealth creators and pioneers of the new age economy outperform in today's fast-growing economy. To know more about the story of the Avendis Group, we met Ranu Vora, co-founder and executive vice chairman Avendis. Well, Tridip Nilesh, I'll catch with you in a bit, but uh, Mr. Vora, if I can take some of your time, if we can... Uh... So, uh, you know, Mr. Vora, obviously, uh, Avendis rich history. Uh, it's one of the top five wealth management businesses in India. Uh, but uh, tell me a little bit about um, the journey. What are some of the major milestones that have come in these last 22 years? I think it's been a wonderful journey over the mm -hmm. last 22 years. Mm -hmm. um, we started with a traditional investment yeah. banking business yeah, yeah, yeah. and then we built other businesses, uh, you know, like the wealth management business, asset management business, and also the credit solutions business right. alongside that. We've had several versions along the way. Um, you know, I still remember there was a point of time when Avendis um, concluded the transaction of selling Satyam yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. in 2009. It was a very large transaction at that point of time. It was a very marquee transaction mm -hmm. given the stakeholders involved and the fact that the company was not just listed in India, but also yes. in the US. Yes. Uh, follow that with, I think, the next big milestone which happened in our lives with um, our start of the private wealth business, mm -hmm. asset management business in 2010. Yes. Um, take it to 2016 when we partnered with KKR yeah. and we started our credit solutions business. So that mm -hmm. was one very large milestone. Uh, while we've had 22 years of history with, uh, you know, behind us, uh, it's been a slow evolution for us from going from one business to these yeah. businesses which you see today. And, and to now, the, the big milestones which I am very proud of now mm. is the way we have gone about in these businesses. For instance, on, uh, in, as per global data, we are the second largest investment bank in Asia mm -hmm. in terms of number of transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, the best independent private wealth manager in India. Uh, as per right. Asian private banker. So those are those to me are big milestones, big validations yeah. uh, which have come about, uh, but it's it's part of a long, long journey. Well, I'm sure this is just the start of a very long journey. But you know, like you spoke about the, the financial services space. Now obviously this space is evolving, it's growing. There are now a number of more players right now than what they were maybe 22 years ago. But what's What's the unique selling point of uh, Avendis? What makes Avendis different from the many other players out there? I think I have 
you know, in, in this journey, uh, my fellow co-founders co and the senior leadership mm. has kept it very simple. Mm. We are long-term, we are truly long-term players. Mm. We mm. don't believe in, you know, have a business here today, in two months kind of just change it around. Yeah. So being truly long-term mm. is, is an attribute of Avendis. Uh, we have invested in areas ahead of time. For yeah. instance, we looked at digital and tech way back in 2009 mm. when, when no one was looking at it. Uh, we are looking at areas like EVs yeah. today. Yeah. Uh, and, and a few years back, we started looking at that area. Uh, so we have invested ahead of time and then we have stayed in. You know, we, have, we are all into those businesses. We are trying to mm -hmm. make sure that uh, you know, we stay there. And the other part, which I think is as important for us is, uh, how do you create businesses which are well aligned with clients? Yeah, right. very true. Synergistic businesses. Uh, you know, as I said, we are not momentum players. The idea is not to have one business disconnected with the other business. How do you create synergistic businesses mm. which are all around the value and value proposition to the client? Uh, that has been a big focus for us. Mm -hmm. So synergistic, uh, focused, yeah. uh, and aligned. What's the special mix that Avendis has in the asset management business? If you could tell me a little bit about that. We've tried to, asset management is a very large, very mm. wide area in India. We've tried to be focused in specific parts of asset management, mm -hmm. which are in line with our strengths, where we have some right to win, we can be, we, uh, you can bring in some advantage. Mm. For example, uh, Nilesh Didi, who mm. heads our structured credit mm. fund. Mm. I think it's a good white space in India. Mm. There are a lot of mid-sized companies looking for solutions, uh, both for the entrepreneurs as well as for the corporate. Mm -hmm. So it addresses a specific need. We have a future leaders fund which focuses on such opportunities, late stage mm -hmm. opportunities in digital mm -hmm. consumer. Mm -hmm. right. On the public equity side, we've created uh, India's largest hedge fund yeah, and yeah. alternates business, which is the largest long short fund in India. Um, we have almost a 60% market share in that category. And then we have a long only business, which is which mm. is very special because mm. we think there is a lot of disruption, which is happening in the whole long only equities part of the business. Traditionally, they were approach, approaching the stock markets in a certain yeah. way. We are looking at them in a different way. Well, Mr. Vora, before I let you go, one last question. What's the way ahead for Avendis? What are some of the future plans? I think we have to just uh, keep pace with our clients. Uh, our clients are galloping fast. Uh, we have made significant headway. Mm in digital and tech. We are the leading investment bank right. in digital and tech with more than 60% market share. Those companies oh. are doing well. India is a big story around digital and tech. So we want to continue mm -hmm. moving in that direction in a strong way. Mm -hmm. The idea is not to have too many businesses, too many products. The idea is to be focused and aligned right. in right. what we do. What is okay. most important to us is how do we continue to be relevant to our clients? Right. I would say the, the headroom exists. We just have to execute well on those aspects. Fantastic. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, all of my best wishes for the way ahead. I will be talking to some of your other colleagues after this. So to our viewers, don't go anywhere. It's time for a short break here on this special episode of ET Global Business Summit, the Disrupt X series, where we're featuring the Avendus Group. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this special episode of ET Global Business Summit Disrupt X Series where we're featuring the Avendus Group and I'm now in conversation with Nilesh Dedi. He's the Head of Structured Credit at Avendus. <music> Nilesh, thank you so much for talking to us. Let's talk about this structured credit because uh, I, I mean, I know that in your business, if my stats are correct, you've done over 50 unique transactions over the last five years, which I believe makes you one of the largest structured credit platforms. Uh, but let's take a step back. Let's start from the basics. Just tell me a little bit about what structured credit is. What does it mean? In simple term, I would say, Sumit, that anything which is not traditional debt or equity is structured credit, mm. right? Okay. People call it by many names like structured credit, private credit, special situation financing, structured finance. But at the core of it, the principle remains the same, mm. that it is a flexible capital mm. customized 
to a particular situation to meet a particular requirement. And it doesn't follow the templatized approach of a set parameters, like typically you will see a lot of that players doing it, right? So traditionally what we have seen is that there have been two large pools of capital. One has been on the debt side, which is your banks or the bond market. However, what happens is that on the bank side, uh, their end use is very, very specific, either for capital expenditure or for working capital. While bond market is typically available mostly for the high rated companies, double A and plus, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have risk capital available, which is through private equity players, public markets and all that. However, their return expectations are 20%, 25% plus, right? So there is an asset class, which is between 11 to 20%, which was non-existent mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. uh, which is what now we are trying to cater to through structural credit. So yes, I mean, in nutshell, I would say that is anything which is between 11 to 20% return and not, or not debt equity, it's mm -hmm. the structural credit. So Nilesh, what led to the emergence of this uh, new asset or, you know, if you call it investment class, whichever one you want to call it. And most importantly, how is it disrupting your traditional uh, capital uh, providing markets? So I would say, first of all, the asset class itself is a disruption to the traditional uh, yeah. modes of capital providing, let's say banks or uh, uh, equity mm -hmm. investors, uh, because every situation is unique and every solution that's why has to be unique, mm -hmm. right? So no two deals are same. Mm -hmm. And that's why it requires a lot of innovative thinking uh, to kind of come out with a solution which suits a particular requirement. As far as what has led to the emergence, yes. I would probably say both demand side requirement as well as supply side availability. When we started this 10 years back, there was very little kind of awareness in the market, yeah. right? Not a lot of companies or promoters were looking at this as a product mm -hmm. and there weren't many supplies also for uh, this kind of a capital. But now what has happened is over the years, uh, companies are looking at this product as one of the important solution providers for many of their situations. Right, right. They're reimagining their capital structure, which is through a mix of debt, equity, and structural credit mm -hmm. as well. For promoters, this has opened up a new avenue of financing, which otherwise hitherto was not available to them earlier. So I would say on the demand side, we are seeing a lot of traction. Nilesh, but you know, what are the new things? What are some of the innovations that Avendis is doing in this space? Tell us about that. Sure, uh, I can take two or three examples. Let Let's say, for one new product, right? Mm -hmm. uh, loan against unlisted shares. So till six or seven years back, if you see typically, the financing was available to promoter only for the listed shares as a collateral, right? But we realized that there were many high quality unlisted companies which also needed uh, uh, financing. Mm -hmm. And that is where we come up with this product of loan against unlisted share, where as long as fundamentally the company is strong, we are providing the financing to the promoter against the collateral of the unlisted share. Another one, I would say new types of companies. So these days you see emergence of a lot of these new age companies, right, yeah, uh, which yeah. are coming out and disrupting business models. Now, if you look at some of them, we feel that they have reached to the stage of, let's say, being a corporate or enterprise, while mm. in terms of the number of years, they might be only four or five years old. But in terms of establishing their business model, in terms of the way they operate, long-term sustainability, they are as good as any other corporate. Right. However, what happens is that because they are in the services industry, uh, they may not have your traditional uh, uh, assets as a collateral like your land, building, or plant and machinery. Mm. And that is where we look at the business value and finance also. Many of them have not reached to that mature stage of cash flow generation, right? But that doesn't mean that the business value is not there. So we are financing yeah, yeah. some of these new age uh, uh, companies also. And the third, I would say a new industry. Uh, let's take, for example, electric vehicle industry, which is going through a lot of uh, uh, boom right now. So yes, you need to spot the train early and then obviously capitalize it. Uh, Nilesh, before I let you go, just wanting to know what your uh, insights are for the way ahead. How do you see the industry going forward? So while there is no formal market data is available on the size of the industry because it encompasses many players and many yeah. kind of products, right? On one hand, you have some of the asset management companies which are targeting 11 to 13% product which were earlier done by mutual funds. Then you have NBFCs which are targeting 13 to 15% kind of a yield bucket. Then you have structured credit fund, prior credit funds which are targeting 16 to 18. And then you have special situation funds which are targeting 18 to 20. So it's a very, very wide, uh, I would say, in the spectrum in which people play. But in our estimate, in the performing credit space, uh, we feel the market is around three to $5 billion uh, uh, annually and it is growing very fast. Fantastic. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Nilesh. Thank you so much for sharing all those insights with us. Uh, but you know, there is a lot more to know about the Avendis story. And for that, I'm next in conversation with Tridip Pathak. He's the Portfolio Manager at Avendis Olivo.
Hi, Tridip. Thank you so much for talking to us. I want to talk to you about the strategy behind uh, Avendus Olivo. I know it's a, a long-only PMS fund. Can you tell me what do you mean by mainstreaming of uh, digitalization and how is it playing out in India? What we mean by mainstreaming is very clear. Uh, three parts to it. Mm. Uh, we are seeing rising adoption of digitalization by consumers, you know, which was not the case earlier, you know. Uh, we are in kind of a, a digital breakout moment in India, just the way we saw it in China a few years back. Mm. We have nearly about 150 billion online shoppers, which will go up as the number of internet users grows. You know, So rising adoption by consumers is probably mm. one part of it. Uh, the second more important part is the fact that traditional or rather conventional businesses, you know, uh, they are adopting digitalization and running their business, you know. So it is becoming a, from a nice to have concept to a must have concept, you know. Right, yeah. And the third, which we've just seen recently in the last year, uh, is uh, uh, more and more of the startup community is uh, coming mm -hmm. of age and they are coming up into the public markets for listing. Right. In a way, a sign of kind of reaching a certain level of maturity. Mm -hmm. So we will have a lot many more such, uh, you know, uh, listings happening going forward. So, uh, I guess so if I add up all these things, we think digitalization is mainly becoming mainstream. It's percolating yes. everywhere, you know. How is uh, digitalization transforming or disrupting uh, public markets? What's your take on that? Yeah. So there is going to be a significant transformation in the way we are looking at public markets over the next few years. You know, uh, The first part to it is the fact that uh, you will certainly have, as you have more of these companies getting mm -hmm. listed, we expect another $300 billion worth of listings happening in the next two, three years. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, 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 the clear part is uh, we will see market cap weightages for India in the emerging market indices, MSCI, EM index, for example, over a period increasing. The second part, why we think the public markets uh, mm. uh, you know, uh, will get affected, people in the public markets will need to understand is evaluate and understand how to really look and understand the new age right. or other digital businesses. You know? mm. So that is something which is going to be a big ask. You know? How do you evaluate these new age businesses? You know, all of us over the years have got used to uh, in conventional businesses, you know, they have a project implementation period yeah, yeah, yeah. where you set up the plant and then you have uh, the, uh, the, you know, uh, the project is implemented and you have sales coming through and profits coming through, you know. In the case of these companies, the new age businesses, uh, it's different. Uh, mm. You start getting your sales from the day one when you start, okay? Yeah. And you have not reached a critical mass in terms of the number of customers, right? So obviously you will have losses. Uh, mm. So the kind of incubation period during which you are reaching a critical mass, uh, you will have losses. Mm -hmm. Which to us, in a way, uh, we can look upon it uh, more of a, as a, as a quasi-capital expenditure itself. Right. Because you are actually burning money yes. to create your business, to mm. reach it, to adopt consumers and, and all that, you know. Uh, when you evaluate these businesses, uh, there is no other different criterion, uh, you know. We have to use all normal standard metrics which we use for understanding businesses, which is what is the total addressable market, what is the competitive position, mm. uh, you know, how is the corporate governance, you know. Yes. Uh, how is the you know execution excellence uh, uh, in terms of the company, you know, and, and more particularly, what are the parts path to profitability, you know, right. and just how, what is it that is happening as you go forward, and unit economics, how they work and all that. And then let's talk about if, uh, the valuations, because how do you look at these valuations differently from what we've been doing so far? There is a lot of debate mm. that there is a lack of, you know, uh, ability to use traditional valuation measures like price to earnings ratio, yeah. EV to EBITDA or price to sales because you don't have profits, right, uh, in the immediate exactly. term. Exactly. Yeah. But we think this debate is much avoidable. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason is simple. Uh, there is only one valuation measure in this whole universe. Uh, every asset is valued only based on the present value of future cash flows, mm -hmm. or, or in simple ones, the present value of future benefits which are going to come yeah. from the asset, right? Uh, and we use in stock markets, uh, uh, you know, public markets rather, uh, P-E ratio and EV2 beta, more as approximations of the same DCF, which is yeah. a discounted cash flow. But it's easy to use, easy to understand, you know. Uh, so uh, as such, uh, we think um, present value of future cash flows is what mm. has to be done, mm. but it's difficult to use it. Yeah. What we do in our case is we, we, we do uh, what we call as a reverse DCF, you know which is we try to find out that if this is the share price of a particular new age business, uh, what is it that the share price tells you 
about the implied assumption of growth going forward. You know, I'll give you an example. Let's say some of the, most of these new these e-commerce companies have uh, monthly transacting users. You know, mm -hmm. so what is the share price, for example, telling you mm -hmm. about the growth in monthly transacting users going forward in the next five years? And if you arrive at the fact that hey, you know, this uh, growth implied in the current share price is 15% per annum, let's mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. and you feel that no, it is definitely going to be much higher. Uh, than 15%, then it's a clear signal that it's an undervalued business and you should be buying it. Or vice versa, you know, if it right. is so, yeah, that way. Of course. So that is what we, we would uh, be looking into, you know, in that sense, we look into rather. How are you incorporating the impact of digitalization in uh, Avendus Olivo? So this is something uh, we've always said that at Avendus Olivo, we would like to, we are bottom-up stock selectors, but we would always like to uh, keep an eye on the trends which are happening in the economy, which affects individual businesses, you know, which affects our stock selection abilities. So we do keep an eye on, uh, you know, uh, traditional conventional businesses uh, uh, as well as new age businesses uh, as to who is benefiting, you know, what is it, uh, uh, you know. So I can give you some kind of uh, uh, sure. blocks where we look at, we like uh, uh, some of these food technology companies, uh, you mm -hmm. know, some of these QSRs. Mm -hmm. who have now nearly 70-80% of their sales coming from online sources. Even when their restaurants are opening back up and dining, mm -hmm. this is happening, you know. Uh, second, of course, we like a couple of these uh, advertisement technology companies at the root of, you know, programmatic yeah. marketing, you know, uh, you know, more uh, very targeted kind of mm -hmm. using data and data analysis. Uh, and of course, uh, the third bucket would be uh, some of these enablers, you know. Mm. Uh, we like uh, these IT services businesses mm. uh, because not just Indian, but they are helping global companies uh, transform their businesses digitally, you know, cloud yes. migration and, you know, yes. cybersecurity and all. So that's a space we are watching. Uh, we, we, do, we do find opportunities out there. So in, in that sense, we are quite excited about uh, the mainstreaming of digitalization, you know. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, uh, Tridib, for talking to us and for giving us these amazing insights into what's happening at uh, Windus Olivo. Uh, all the very best for the way ahead. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you, Savita. Thank, thank you, you so much. Well, that's all on this very special episode where we got to know a lot more about the Avendis Group and we found out what makes them a class apart. It's plain to see that there is tremendous growth expected in the financial services sector and a disruptor like Avendis will continue to help their clients go from strength to strength, which is why they were featured on this very special episode of ET Global Business Summit Disrupt X series. Thank you so much for watching.